Good evening. Welcome. So delighted to have you here with us tonight. I'm going to be very brief um, because there is so much good that's going to be talked about today, and so much that is important, and I want to get out of the way for it. Um, my name is Deborah Schwartz. I'm the president of the Brooklyn Historical Society, and it is really an honor to be here to launch uh, what will be an extraordinary month of programming uh, under the umbrella 400 years of inequality, slavery, race, and our unresolved history. Um, this is a project that is the vision of my colleague and friend, Marsha Eli, uh, who is the vice president, uh, the executive vice president of the Brooklyn Historical Society, and really the mastermind behind pulling together so many important conversations during the month of October. Uh, and so I really, um, I, I have to tell you that it's been a joy to watch her put all of this together. Um, if you don't have the brochure, you must take it with you and fill your calendar with these dates. Before I turn this over to Marsha, uh, I just want to say a few thank yous. Uh, in this program is a list of funders uh, who immediately recognized the importance and the urgency of the conversations that are going to take place here. Uh, and I want to thank them all for their uh, ability to understand why this kind of dialogue is so important. Uh, and I particularly want to thank several of them who are here with us tonight. Uh, Joanne Witte and Jean Kalin, Sylvia and Byron Lewis, Margaret Seiler and Hovey Brock, um, and there are many, many others, and we really thank you for that. So uh, enjoy the evening, and with that, please, please uh, join me in thanking and welcoming Marsha Eli to the stage. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Deborah. Brooklyn Historical Society was founded in 1863, the same year that the Emancipation Proclamation was signed. In 1863, slavery was illegal in Brooklyn, in all of New York. It's true. Gradual emancipation had taken place between 1799 and 1827. But don't let that lead you to the wrong conclusion. In the late 18th and early 19th century, Brooklyn was the slave-holding capital of New York State. On average, 60% of white families were slaveholders. In the outer areas, like the town of Flatbush, this number was as high as 74%. Brooklyn's slaveholding percentages exceeded those of South Carolina. So the slaveholding families who amassed great wealth live on in the names of our streets. Hicks, Remsen, Bergen. In fact, 82 streets named after Brooklyn's slaveholding families still exist in the borough today. I give this history, which by the way, it's from one of Brooklyn Historical Society's many content-rich project websites. This one is called In Pursuit of Freedom. To bring home the fact that tonight's conversation is not abstract for Brooklyn, this fraught history is here, um, as it is everywhere in the United States. You need only step inside our library right above us here and look at the slavery pamphlets, the runaway slave ads, the slave bill of sales to see what I'm talking about. And this speaks to the concept we're discussing, discussing tonight, repair, and how these decades and centuries later we come to reckon with this past. All of the programs in the series, 400 Years of Inequality, Slavery, Race, and Our Unresolved History, seek to struggle with this past. And I, I really hope that all of you will join us for more. Um, 
I want to join Deborah in thanking our funders um, in absentia, Joanne Witte and Eugene Kalin, who, without whom, uh, who this would not have happened. Um, their support and Joanne's brainstorming um, was absolutely critical. Margaret Seiler and Hubby Brock, your inspiration, Margaret, for the coming to the table. Um, organization that you lead here in Brooklyn and in New York and all of your passion for your activism and um, that has been a model for me as I've thought about these programs. And Sylvia Wong Lewis and Byron Lewis, your gift launched our foundational race and history fund which galvanized so many supporters who were inspired by your vision to look at who makes history through the lens of race, and, and ask, how do we repair the historic record to reflect not only white history? And this fund speaks to some of the most vitally important work that we do. And our partners at the Social Science Research Council, this is the fourth time we have come together to create meaningful and important conversations for a public, these programs, I think, bring together our respective strengths uh, as institutions, and I look forward to working together on what I hope will be many, many, many more programs. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Alondra Nelson, the president of the Social Science Research Council and the Howard F. Linder Professor of Social Science at the Institute for Advanced Study, an independent research center in Princeton, New Jersey. Professor Nelson was previously on the faculty at Columbia University, where she serves as Dean of Social Science, Faculty of Arts and Sciences, Interim Director of the Institution for Social and Economic Research and Policy, and Director of the Institute for Research on Women and Gender. Prior to that, she was a faculty member at Yale University. Professor Nelson has published several award-winning books, along with numerous journal articles, book chapters, commentaries, op-eds. She has served on more boards and chaired more committees and received more fellowships than we really have time to list tonight. Um, so um, on that note, it is really my great pleasure to introduce her and welcome her to the stage. Good evening, everyone. Marcia, thank you for that um, the lovely introduction, but most of all for your extraordinary vision. I remember, uh, well, I was going to say a hot summer day, anticipating this would be a cool fall day, but since it's also a hot summer day, we got together and you had this incredible vision of the series of programs that you wanted to put together and to see it come to fruition so beautifully and so powerfully. I just salute you and thank you for, for the work that you did to make this happen. So um, I'm, as president of the Social Science Research Council, I want to, um, you Know, speak, let you know that I speak on behalf of a, a really sort of international community of, of staff and fellows who are hard at work virtually in every part of the globe. Um, and some are here, of us, here with us this evening. And I want to say on behalf of all of us how pleased we are to have this partnership with the Brooklyn Historical Society, and in particular on tonight's program that will explore our country's evolving conversation about the legacy of racial uh, slavery and the ramifications for today. The Social Science Research Council is a nearly 100-year-old um, independent research nonprofit that's dedicated to mobilizing social science for the public good. And our work is deeply rooted in the belief that robust social knowledge is essential for achieving justice and equality even in this moment. The council fosters research innovation. We train, um, uh, we help to um, build capacity in young scholars. We um, try to deepen inquiry across disciplines and sectors of academic scholarly research. And we do this through um, various means. A lot of them are working, uh, those, these means are working with um, groups of distinguished institutions, including the United Nations, networks of colleges and universities across the world, think, top, think tanks, nonprofits, and cultural institutions. And we are deeply, deeply honored um, to count the Brooklyn Historical Society among our esteemed partners. 
The work that we do at the Social Science Research Council covers a range of themes from climate change to racial inequality and touches, as I said, virtually every region of the world. Um, for our part, this event tonight is part of the SSRC's Inequality Initiative, which is a series of programs and projects that the Council is using to bring innovative social science analysis to bear on our understanding of the roots and consequences of unequal participation in political, economic, and social systems across the globe. Um, as Marcia said, this um, event tonight uh, started with uh, four events ago with an event entitled Elections in the Age of Trump um, that brought together 538 senior political writer Clara Malone in conversation with a political scientist at George Washington University, um, then at George Washington University, John Sides, um, and who was co-author of uh, a new book called Identity Crisis, the 2016 Presidential Campaign and the Battle for the Meaning of America. Tonight, we're excited to be able to hold a discussion examining another battle for the meaning of America in another way, and for a conversation that will discuss the possibilities for confronting and repairing a legacy of slavery in this country, and indeed to explore one concrete example of how this is happening today. As you know, in 1838, Georgetown College, now university, sold more than 272 enslaved African people, the GU-272, downriver to secure its financial health. Um, the Georgetown Slavery Archive um, and work that Professor Rothman um, and is, is engaged in is beginning to bring to light in unprecedented detail how an entire community was transformed by slavery and indeed an entire nation. Um, at the SSRC, we're glad to have this work for our part um, sponsored by uh, the Rockefeller Foundation through our Scholarly Pro Borderlands program and also the Ford Foundation. I wanted to be sure to thank those funders. So let's get started with this important and powerful conversation. It will be moderated this evening by Rachel Swarns, a journalist, uh, author, and now professor who writes about race and race relations as a contributing writer for the New York Times. Her article about Georgetown's roots in slavery touched off a national conversation about American universities and their tie to this painful period of our history. Rachel is the author of American Tapestry, the story of black, white, and multiracial ancestors of Michelle Obama, and co-author of Unseen, Unpublished Black History from the New York Times Photo Archives. She's currently at work on a book about Georgetown's roots in slavery that's forthcoming from Random House. So please join me in ra welcoming Rachel and our panelists, Melisande short Colomb, Professor Adam Rothman, and Professor, Professor Adam uh, Catherine Franke to the stage. Thank you. So I am thrilled to be here because it feels to me like we're in a really important moment. Reparations, the question of reparations has become an issue in the presidential campaign. Students at Georgetown University voted this spring to create a reconciliation fund uh, to help the descendants of those people who were sold to help keep the school afloat. And last month, the Virginia Theological Seminary, an Episcopal seminary, um, decided to create a $1.7 million reparations fund. Um, even when I was invited here, I, I don't think I could have imagined all of this happening. And I'm thrilled to see such a diverse audience interested in this subject because it is so urgent and so important and because it's our history. And this reckoning and this grappling um, with the legacy of slavery is something um, that belongs to all of us, regardless of where we stand on the color line. So I'm thrilled to see all of you here. And I'm gonna do some introductions before we get started. Catherine Franke is the Salzbecker Professor of Law, Gender, and Sexuality Studies at Columbia University, where she also directs the Center for Gender and Sexuality Law. Catherine is the faculty director of the Law, Rights, and Religion Project. She is among the nation's leading scholars writing on law, religion, and rights, drawing from feminist, queer, and critical race theory. Her most recent book, which you saw up top there, Repair, Redeeming the Promise of Abolition, makes the case for reparations today by telling the story of experiments in South Carolina and Mississippi in the 1860s 
in which free people were given land explicitly as reparation for enslavement and then had it taken away by the government. Adam Rothman is professor of history at Georgetown and principal curator of the Georgetown Slavery Archive, which I have to say is so awesome. If you haven't looked at it, you really need to. <laughs> Adam studies the history of the United States from the Revolution to the Civil War and the history of slavery and abolition in the Atlantic world. His most recent book is Beyond Freedom's Reach, A Kidnapping in the Twilight of Slavery, which received numerous awards, including the Humanities Book of the Year by the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities, the Jefferson Davis Book Award, and the Margaret T. Lane Virginia F. Saunders Memorial Research Award. He also created the African American Passages, Black Lives in the 19th Century podcast. Melisan Short Cologne is a descendant of the 272 enslaved people that Georgetown sold in the 19th century to help pay off its debts. She's a mother, a grandmother, a professional chef, and a Georgetown undergraduate. So welcome, please, to our panel. Good evening, everyone. Um, I want to thank uh, the Brooklyn Historical Society, the SSRC, for hosting this event, and I really want to thank all of you for coming out on this nice summer evening um, in the rain uh, to have a, what I hope will be an uncomfortable conversation about why we're talking about reparations. Uh, and why we must talk about reparations. So um, one of the things I want to suggest, and I, I do in the book and I will do tonight as well, uh, is that you consider, and you consider hard, what is the relationship between reparations and freedom? Not just reparations and slavery, but reparations in freedom. And what I want to suggest, if we look back at our country's history, and what happened when we ended the institution of slavery formally through a series of steps culminating in the 13th Amendment that abolished the institution of slavery. But what we see through that process of abolition is that there's an enormous difference between being freed and being free. And what we did is we emancipated four million people in this country, but we didn't really make them free. And we're still living with the vestiges of that failed project of truly creating the conditions for freedom for formerly enslaved people in this country. And I hope that will help frame some of the discussion that we're going to have today. Kiango Yamana Taylor has written a book that maybe some of you have read, which is um, asks us the question of how do we get free? Um, and I think she's specifically addressing, of course, African American people in this country. And in the context of slavery and reparations, of course we want to ask the hard question of how do African Americans shed a badge of inferiority that attaches to color, that attaches to race, that is a manifestation of white supremacy in this country, of which chattel slavery is only one part of the work that white supremacy does. But getting free is about shedding that badge of inferiority. But I also want to say that white people have a role in this, in this question of how do we get free. Because we too have to get free of a history that we are implicated in, in terms of the kind of privilege and power, access to opportunity that we have not earned. So this is our project too. And so I'm happy to see that we have a, a very diverse group of people here tonight to think about these issues. So a very well-known historian of slavery and of racial justice in this country once asked, um, or once described, slavery as a form of social death. So if slavery is a form of social death, what kind of social life was made possible with the abolition of slavery? with the end of slavery, into what kind of lives were enslaved people delivered once the institution of slavery was abolished through a set of steps. So I, I want to bring them in the room. These are, we need them with us. 
as we talk about these issues. And of course, having Melisande here with us as a descendant of, of some of these people, particularly in the Georgetown context, is enormously important. But these are in a, uh, a complicated kinship group, complicated family on the Sea Islands of South Carolina in 1861. They were enslaved there as were uh, 10 to 15,000 black people. Uh, and in 1861, the northern troops arrived, occupied the Sea Islands, and their white owners fled to the mainland and abandoned the plantations. So here we have a white military official standing with another group of, of neighbors, of, of the people before. The only difference between the conditions of these people who are free and these people who were not is the presence of a white man. That's what it meant to be freed through military occupation in 1861 in New York, excuse me, in, in um, uh, the Sea Islands of South Carolina. So for them and the soldiers, the white northern soldiers who were charged with attending to their needs in this transition from the violence, the death, the rape, the torture, the family separation, and of course forced labor that is what slavery was and is, Right? The northern soldiers who were responsible for that humanitarian project were immediately moved by the conditions in which people were living here and that they were owed something more than mere emancipation. They needed something more than merely being freed, but that to be really free required resources and community. So Rufus Saxton was the general in charge of the Sea Islands humanitarian project um, in this period. Uh, and it, a little bit later in 65, but earlier, he very clearly said that what the freed people of the Sea Islands are owed is the land because this land is held in a constructive mortgage for them. They have a better claim to this land than do the white people who fled it who have, might have had more proper title to it before they fled and before the military, northern military occupied it. So what he set about to do is listen to what freed people wanted. And what they wanted was land and the resources to farm that land and for white people to get out. And that's what he did. He apportioned the land in large plots, and this is later in the story where we get the idea of 40 acres and a mule, but he apportioned the land in large plots to the, the freed people who lived there, asked them to make claims to the land. And here we have freed people in documents that, um, um, the original documents I spent a lot of time with, writing their names with an X to the land that was formerly a plantation on which they were enslaved in complex family units, not in nuclear families, but in complicated families, extended families, extended kinship networks. Of course, they could not write their names because it was a crime to teach an enslaved person how to read or write. And so here we have their names signed in an X. And as a historian spending time in these archives, I opened this document for the first time since it was put there in 1861, I get a little choked up talking about it. You could feel, you could see a thumbprint from the ink where the people were holding a quill pen to sign their names, or a print from the palm of their hand. These were the first acts of freedom that they engaged in as they were experiencing what it was to live a new social life rather than the social death of slavery. They also, Made, and here's their handwriting just a little bit more, and you can see some of the smudges and things like that. It's just incredibly moving to witness these documents. And sometimes a hair would fall out, or a little piece of fabric, evidence of lives. And it's, it's why those of us who do historical work are so moved by the original documents and why you should spend time here at the Brooklyn Historical Society going through the documents that are in the library upstairs that are just incredible. So what they also did is they made little maps of the plots that they wanted where they would live together. And what was among the amazing things is it was women and men alike who were making claims to this land and getting title to it. Pieces of paper with their names on it saying, this is your land. And Saxton said, no white person can set foot here. You need that to heal and to build free lives 
this land as your land, not land that um, you're in some kind of relationship with white people. And so here you can also see the smudges of the ink in a very moving way. So what happens, fast forward, President Lincoln, as you might recall, is assassinated. Andrew Johnson becomes president, and the, one of the first acts of his presidency was to grant amnesty to the former Confederates, the owners, former owners of these people, and restore all their property except in slaves. So all of this land was stolen from these people violently and returned to the people who had owned them before. And they were required to enter into year-long labor contracts with their former owners. That's what it looked like to be freed, but not free. And that's part of why we have this intergenerational transfer of what is an impoverished notion of freedom that African Americans, I believe, live with in this country as compared with white people. And we also know that there is an enormous difference in the amount of intergenerational accumulation of wealth, largely through real estate, owning of land, sitting on it, letting it increase in value, passing it on to your ancestors, that is a deal that black people never got to get into, get in on, the same way that white people have. So this property, what happened to it? This is it. You can see the Pleasant Point Plantation. They have a really nifty little website describes the history of the Pleasant Point Plantation, no mention of slavery, no mention of reparations, no mention of any of that ugly history. Here they are at their lovely Christmas party with their little red sweaters, having a lovely time. This is a testament to white innocence. They don't know, and therefore they're not responsible. That's why we have to know this history, that they are living in a place on the, the, the crushed lives crushed notions of freedom of the freed people of this area. So I'll just leave you with one other photo of someone you may know, um, Martin Luther King, who in his uh, camp, uh, people's, uh, Poor People's Campaign was very clearly talking about reparations as land was being handed out at the same time I'm talking about in the 1860s and 70s to white people in the western part of the country for free. Black people were basically folded into a kind of new servitude in the name of being freed but not free. Thank you. Thank you. So your book came out this spring, and um, books, as you all may know, um, often you know generate and germinate for a while. Um, but yours came out at a very good time for a book about uh, repair and reparations to come out. But I'm wondering um, what, what inspired it? And, and if you have um, a sense of um, why now um, this issue, which I can't imagine you imagine that it would be such a timely, maybe you did, um, but, but what inspired you and, and why do you think we are at this moment now where this conversation is um, you know, being had widely across the country? One of the ways we as historians work is you're researching one book and then you find um, material for the next book while you're doing that research. You think that stuff's not gonna fit in this book, but it will fit in the next book. So the last book was on marriage and what it meant for African Americans to marry for the first time at the end of the Civil War, and whether there were any um, lessons that today's same-sex marriage movement could learn about what it is to be free through the institution of marriage. And as I was in archives researching marriage, I came across these experiments in freedom in um, the Sea Islands, and, in, and then there's another part of the book that talks about Mississippi outside Vicksburg. You know, I'm not the first historian to, to, to write about them, but it struck me that a kind of contemporary framing of the relevance of um, the failure to really render people free was something we needed to know more about. And most people don't know these stories. You're, you're you know, right about that. Historians who work in a very particular period, and there are few of us who do, but most of us don't. And uh, I felt like it was a story that needed to be told not in an academic book, but in a book for um, uh, intelligent, curious readers like this audience here. Um, so why? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So I had no idea that we'd be talking about reparations when the book came out. It took me 10 years to write it. Um, 
So why are we talking about it now? And I get to ask this question a lot, and I think part of it is that we have many more African American people in political leadership in this country than we have ever had before, and their constituencies are pushing them to talk about it. Um, there are also groups who have been working on reparations in COBRA and other groups for a very long time um, and have had trouble getting traction in the mainstream media or in the political world that I think having um, prominent elected officials of color has helped draw attention to the issue. And then I think we have a form of abject and honest white supremacy at work in the White House in a way we've not seen before. There has always, of course, been some degree of racism or white supremacy in our political culture, but the way in which Donald Trump is so frank about it, I think has provoked many people, and, and white people in particular, to, to be reminded, oh right, we still have to deal with this. I don't think for people of color that was something that they felt was not, <laughs> didn't need addressing, but I think particularly for white people, they were like, oh, this stuff is still very deep in this culture. Charlottesville, those sorts of things. So those are my guesses, and I'm sure the other panelists have other, and, and you yourself have thoughts about why this is the case. Adam, I wanted to ask you, and I'll, I'll, I'll throw that at you also, but first, um, one thought I have about that is just about the work that you guys did and are still doing at Georgetown in terms of helping to set the stage for the conversation that is ongoing now. And um, you all know about the story um, in 1838 about the people that were sold to help save the school. Adam was on a working group um, at the university um, set up to help uh, the university to figure out how to grapple uh, with this history. And the university took a number of steps, um, including um, deciding to offer preferential status in admissions, effectively legacy status to descendants. Uh, one of the first, the only university that we know that has taken such a step. And I'm wondering if you can talk about that. Um, Ta-Nehisi Coates, I remember at the time when it was announced, said that this was like opening the door um, to this kind of fuller discussion about reparations. Uh, thanks, Rachel. Um, thanks, everybody, for being here. It's wonderful to be able to talk about history in the Brooklyn Historical Society. What a thrill. Um, and especially this topic, which is so timely and so deep. Um, the th one of the things that really resonated with me with what Professor Frankie was saying was the image at the end of Pleasant Point Plantation um, a site of innocence, a site of beauty, a site with a, an entirely whitewashed history. Uh, that really resonated with me because um, at Georgetown, we really, we really pride ourselves on our history. The university was founded in 1789. It has deep roots. Uh, much of its prestige comes from its longevity. Uh, and we, we celebrate that history all the time. Uh, but there's this other history that Georgetown was involved in as well that had mostly been overlooked. Now, it's interesting that um, the history of Georgetown, the Jesuits, and slavery was not a secret. In fact, Jesuit historians had been writing about it for 100 years. My predecessor uh, in the history department at Georgetown in his bicentennial history of the university actually writes about Georgetown and slavery in the 1838 sale. Uh, the American Studies program at Georgetown in the 1990s had a whole curriculum around this history. So what was really shocking what, to me wasn't so much the history, but that when we started, when President DeJoya started the working group in the fall of 2015, that this history was unknown to so many people across the university campus and beyond. It was as if it had been a secret. And that made, uh, that made me, me feel, as, a, as an academic historian, pretty bad. I felt like we had not done our job in translating uh, what a small group of academic scholars knew into public knowledge. So I felt like one of the really important things we could do on the working group was simply to teach the history in some new and creative ways so that it would, it would just sink in 
um, to the university community and beyond. So that's one of the reasons why we launched the Georgetown Slavery Archive, which is a website dedicated to uh, giving um, everybody access to the original archival material in the Jesuit and college archives about our history of slavery. And it goes beyond just the 1838 sale. Uh, the Jesuits had plantations across Maryland. The original idea for the college was that the profits from those plantations would help to subsidize education for white students at the college. Um, the college itself was a site of slave labor. If you read through the ledgers of the college, you'll find people like Suki and Gabriel and Charles Taylor and Aaron Edmondson, who was the last enslaved person to work at Georgetown. Um, and I just, I think, so, so creating that archive, uh, speaking at places like this about Georgetown's history is just a way of um, reversing that erasure, of making sure that we know the full history. And I think at Georgetown, it's had an impact. Like we think about our history in a different way. We think about our identity as a Catholic and Jesuit university in a different way now, and that this history, many people around the university feel that it changes our obligations um, to teach and act um, in new ways today. Uh, we can get into all of that. But I think one of the things I, I really learned uh, through the working group that, is that we have to tell this history in some new ways so that people can't live in oblivion. Has it had an impact, do you think, um, on other universities and um, their own explorations of this history in, on their own campuses? Yeah, I think it has had an impact. I want to say that we were in no way the first university to do this. I think it's very important to recognize that Brown University uh, in 2004 under President Ruth Simmons launched uh, a really pioneering investigation of that university's ties to slavery. That was really the blueprint for how a university can research its history. And, the, and it, it was the first university to try to respond in some creative ways to that. So we were inspired by other universities like Brown and the University of Virginia that had done this kind of work. But certainly since, uh, since I think the publicity, uh, thanks Rachel, <laughs> that, the Georgetown, that Georgetown's history got, I think it really has spread like wildfire. There's now a consortium called Universities Studying Slavery that has more than 50 uh, member colleges and universities, not just in the United States, but in other countries, Canada, the United Kingdom, South Africa. So it's become um, a, a really an international movement of institutions of higher education trying to fully understand their histories. So it's had a broad impact, and it's had a tremendous impact at home, uh, as evidenced, I think, by the student vote on the Reconciliation Fund last yeah. semester. And so, Melly, I wanted to turn to you. We have two amazing historians, as you can see here. Um, but this is not just about history. It's about here. It's about now. It's about um, people, right? Um, people like uh, Melly, like many of you, uh, like me, who are descended um, from these enslaved folks. And I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about learning um, about your connection. Sure. Um, thank you all for being here this evening, all you wonderful, beautiful faces. It's great to see you, and I'm very, very happy to be a part of this gathering this evening. I grew up in a family in Louisiana, southeast Louisiana, um, with a grandmother who was the second generation born past slavery, uh, born to a first generation mother. Uh, who was 18 years old when she was born, and the women who delivered my grandmother into the world were the hands and the hearts and the love of women who had been sold to Louisiana in 1838. That was the family into which my grandmother was born. Those were the people who loved her and told their family stories and spoke of their lives here in Maryland. Well, not here, 
down there <laughs> in Maryland um, that stretched back more than a century. Um, she talked about the Leonides meteor shower and how her grandmother as a young girl and her family members and great grandmothers went out into the fields and the cabins and they watched for many nights as the stars fell. And those are stories that I heard as a girl in New Orleans, Louisiana about my ancestors and my family who came to the Maryland colony. Original grandmothers arrived in Maryland as indentured servants, as most people did, in 1677 and 1715. And because of laws that were changing in the colonies at the time, those women who were black women at the end of their indenture because there could be no free black woman walking around in these colonies, their indenture was rescinded and they were made slaves for life. And all of their children who were born were slaves for life for one reason only, the color of their skin. And it's as simple as that. So, I am an 11th generation American. I look like America. And I'm not an academic. I grew up hearing these family stories. And in August of 2016, I get a Facebook message from Judy Rifle, who has been hired um, by the Georgetown Memory Project and Richard Cellini. And Rachel had written this wonderful story in April. I had just come back from St. Croix after a year in St. Croix. And I read this great story, and my heart was filled with so much joy that there were people who could directly connect to a seminal event in the lives of their families and say, we know what happened. Several months later, I get this message. I had never connected my family and the stories that I heard from my grandmother about the Queens and the Mahoney's and Frederick, uh, I'm sorry, Francis Scott Key representing our family in lawsuits which actually happened in the state of, of Maryland. My family was suing the Jesuits for their freedom in the 1700s. And some of them won. Some of them did not. How do you free some of a family, but not other parts of a family? So it's a very complicated, convoluted, and economic story. Yes, we have the moral, terrible thing that slavery was and Jim Crow and, and the, the, the destruction and abandonment of Reconstruction when black people in America were making very big strides and yet there was a deliberate walking away from what was Reconstruction to bring in Jim Crow. And bringing in Jim Crow meant also that we as a society accepted the lost cause doctrine of the South, that there were no bad guys. This wasn't about slavery, it was about states' rights. 
And all of that, the Negroes were happy. And they didn't do a thing to self-emancipate themselves. It was all the wonderful Irish boys who came over and gave their lives so black people could be free. So we have these mythologies that we have woven into the fabric of how we all see ourselves as Americans in 2019. But when I was born in 1954, that's not how we saw ourselves. Because most of the people in America who were people of color in 1954 were in fact multi-generational descendants of people who had been enslaved. And a whole bunch of European immigrants. So, I'm not going to talk too much about that because we have to get to the question. <laughs> oh, no. But I grew up knowing, and there was a, um, my family was connected to slavery in Louisiana and, to ba and, and in Maryland. So I tell folks I got tobacco juice and sugarcane juice in my blood, <laughs> you know, and swamp mud between my feet. Um, but for 50 years, from 1739 until Georgetown University was established in 18, I'm sorry, 1789, for 50 years, the profits from the concentrated slave labor camps that people like to call plantations went into a fund to build Georgetown University. So it's, there was a sale in 1838, but there was 150 years of enslavement and deprivation before that. And from 1838 to 1864, there was still some slaves owned by the Jesuits and Georgetown University. Talking about the mythologies that we hold on to, um, your work breaks a lot of that down. And you're, you're right that I think most people, I certainly didn't know anything about these experiments that you describe in your book. Can you talk a little more about them and what they, what lessons they teach us. What, what happened, um, and Mississippi was one that you, you didn't talk about, but what can we take away from that that's relevant to our thinking about this issue today? Part of why I think these stories are compelling, they certainly were to me, <clears throat> is because we think reparations are, are too hard to do, and that it's a radical modern idea. But it's what people were thinking about at the moment of emancipation. It, it is part of our history that we were, we, some of us understood that something more than mere emancipation was owed to formerly enslaved people. So uh, just outside of Vicksburg, Mississippi, Joseph Davis, who was Jefferson Davis's elder brother, had a plantation on which many black people were enslaved. And um, when General Grant came um, down the Mississippi and occupied Vicksburg in 1863, um, all the white landowners left, property owners left, slave owners left, and a similar experiment in freedom um, uh, under, was undertaken there, where black people were given the, pro the plantation and said, it's yours. You, you who have lived here are owed this land, and you are owed new lives without us around, without us white people around. Uh, and that too, ended very abruptly, somewhat differently than the Sea Islands experiment, but ended very abruptly. Um, if you go to Vicksburg now and you go looking for Briar uh, Field, the, the plantation there, the Mississippi ate it up. It's not, actually, the land's not there anymore. Um, but this land, the Sea Islands land, is, is definitely there. 
Um, uh, I, I don't think that would have been what was appropriate as reparations in 1861, 1863, 1865 is necessarily what we should do today, that these people at Pleasant Point Plantation should be um, kicked off the land. Uh, and have it returned to people who had previously been enslaved there. You know, many of those folks wouldn't want to return there. Um, uh, they're living lives elsewhere. Um, but I do think, thinking about reparations today, in, f in the form of land, not just checks, um, that white people would write or the government would write to um, either narrowly the descendants of enslaved people or to black people more, more um, broadly, that that's, that's a, um, not the most effective way to think the problem. Because I think what we need to do is, because it's been such a long time, is think collectively. That white people and the society more generally, just as Georgetown University has embraced this idea of collective responsibility, so to collective benefit of uh, reparations is something we should think about today. So what I suggest in the book is that we increase the estate tax. My generation is about to inherit the largest um, intergenerational transfer of wealth we have ever seen on this planet. And largely, my parents' generation have money to pass down and substantial money to pass down because of real estate, the increase in real estate um, value in this country. That's a lottery. I have, no, I have no greater entitlement to that money just because me or someone like me got born into a family that happened to have real estate at some point. Um, and so having some kind of collective consciousness that these are resources that need to be redistributed, particularly in the form of property or land for people who were property, strikes me as, an, as, as one way to think about reparations today. Um, Adam, I wanted to ask you, you're obviously a historian of this period too, um, but um, you have been thrust in real time into like stuff that's moving right now. <laughs> and, um, and, and you become you know, an actor in it in a way, not just a scholar of it. Um, you've helped to identify um, this growing, um, members of this growing descendant community. You've created this archive, um, which is bringing these records not only to scholars, but to families. Um, you are on a campus where there is a student movement. I'm just wondering, as a historian, to see kind of history's reverberations, like, like and be right in it, what, what is that like? Uh, it's extremely scary. <laughs> um, uh, you know, uh, for mo most of my career as a historian, I was basically talking to other historians and other academics um, and students at Georgetown. And that's a fairly comfortable place for, for me for, to be. And uh, it, it was not so comfortable to, to, to find myself you know, on the front page of the New York Times talking about this history. Um, it's just a, a, an unusual place to be, and not always easy to navigate the different demands on you as a historian. And I'll give you an example, the issue of reparations. Um, I actually feel extremely uneasy taking any kind of public stand on specific policy recommendations uh, about reparation for a couple of reasons. One, I'm actually creating this archive. Uh, doing historical research, excavating the archives, putting them online. And I really wouldn't want anybody to think that I'm cooking the books to tilt the historical record towards one particular uh, policy preference or another in favor of reparations or against it. Similarly, I teach a lot about this history. And if my students know oh, Rothman, he's, he's like really pro-reparations or really anti-reparations, I, I would actually worry that they could not have as as, as, um, as robust conversations in my class, knowing that I have a, you know, this, uh, I'm a campaigner for a one particular form of reparations. Um, on the other hand, a lot of people want to know what I think about it. So, you know, it's a bit of a, of, um, uh, a, bit of a vice. But on the other hand, um, I have to say that this work has been far and away the most rewarding and gratifying work of my career as a historian for the simple fact that it seems to matter to so many people in such deep and emotional kinds of ways. And that is certainly true um, 
certainly it's true of the students at Georgetown who for the first time realize, some, um, many of them for the first time realize, particularly the white students at Georgetown who come from uh, the North, uh, that their lives have something to do with this history of slavery. Uh, and then when they see the actual documents, when they see an advertisement for a runaway slave named Isaac, who had run away from Georgetown College, it sort of hits them in a different way. Um, and uh, and it, it, it's, uh, you, can, you can see the, um, the, um, the wheels turning in their heads as, they, as, they, as that kind of obliviousness falls away. But also with the descendant families. You know, one of, the, one of the harms of slavery, one of the effects of social death, was something that Orlando Patterson, who came up with this idea of social death, calls natal alienation. Really, the separation of families and the separation of people from their own histories. And you can see that through genealogy, uh, something uh, Professor Nelson has written about in The Social Life of DNA. Uh, the way that it's, it can be extremely difficult for people of African descent in this country whose families go back to the era of slavery to trace their family trees all the way back. You know, uh, when you go back to the 1840s and 1850s, uh, for people whose families were free at that point, you can find their names in the census. Uh, there are slave schedules in the 1850 and 1860 census with a lot of information about an, an, the enslaved population, but guess what? There are no names. They did not record their names. And so it can be very difficult for African Americans to do that genealogical research, research back to 1674, like Melisande. But through the Jesuit archives at Georgetown, we have this incredible density of archival material, both bills of sale, property records on the one hand, and sacramental records on the other, baptismal records, which can help people piece together their family trees back to the era of slavery. And I have to say, you know, you can find the same names in the property records that you can find in the sacramental registers. And if you can understand how the Jesuits could baptize their slaves one day and sell them the next, then you understand American slavery. But, you know, being able to help descendant families piece together their genealogies, um, you know, sort of along the lines of the work that the Georgetown Memory Project has, has done to sit with um, Melisande and other uh, mem members of the descendant community in the Georgetown archives, looking at the material, hearing their stories about their families, is um, for me a really unbelievable experience. And I hope that people would think of that as part of the process of repair. And uh, Melisan is uh, one of uh, the first uh, descendants who are enrolled at Georgetown, you know, through this program, right? Uh, legacy, real mm -hmm. legacy, right? <laughs> That's <what> um, <laughs> And, um, and you have been active in this movement on campus, right? Um, to press yes. uh, for, um, and, and students decided to, what, impose a fee? Right, the students, we brought a referendum to the student body, um, which would, in a way, they voted to raise their tuition despite um, the administration and the university saying, we can't raise your tuition for any reason because we know you don't like this. Um, but the students voted to raise their tuition by $27.27 .27 .27 a semester. Um, or, yeah, twenty-seven twenty, something like that. Um, and that number represents the original 272 in all who were the people who, reco who were recorded uh, on the census uh, when it was taken. Um, what was that, um, what was that like? Um, and, and, and the vote um, when it passed? It was very exciting. Um, 
What we found on campus was that in 2015, when the student action started, and this began sort of with students having a problem with um, buildings where they lived and had classes and social activities named after uh, Jesuit priests who were involved in the 1838 sale. The president um, and other administrators were also grappling with their issues about the naming of the buildings and knew that something had to happen. Um, the students protested. Uh, the president convened the working group with Adam and other professors and students, and they did incredible work over an academic school year. And the following year, uh, President DeJoya released the findings of the working group, um, which included um, some very strong um, recommendations to repair and then some suggestions of other things that would be helpful to change the culture of the university and the knowledge of students of the past. So that's sort of where we are now. Um, the, the working group and the president in 2016 said a thing. Um, the students who were graduating this spring were feeling like the school had not come far enough along to keep students who were incoming students engaged with this history. And that generational knowledge once again would slip away from the most important people on the campus who need to know this, the students, not the professors not the administrators. The students who come to Georgetown from all over the world by choice and decision, nobody grabs them up and makes them come, need to know that children younger than them worked for hundreds of years and their freedom was sacrificed for the good of all so Georgetown University could exist today as it does. Is that the only thing that went into making Georgetown University the international institution that it is? No, it's not. But without the foundation of enslavement and human trafficking and the abject not caring. We gonna baptize you, we're gonna marry you, we're gonna baptize your children because we can't have y'all living under our roof in sin. We're the ones who get to commit the sins around here. <laughs> 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 And up to now, the, the, the students voted and approved this, this fund, fund yeah. but? It has not been voted on by the board of directors. They're going to be meeting again tomorrow. Um, they met in June. Uh, the board of directors meets, <coughs> excuse me, three or four times a year. Um, they are aware of the student action, as is the whole world, apparently. But the board of directors is under no obligation to move in any deliberate speed to implement the will of the students. Okay. Well, I think we are now at a time when we are prepared and eager to hear some of your questions. I think, I think we're all uh, cognizant of the devastating impact slavery has had on the economic inequality, the educational inequality of African Americans in the United States. I was reading the other day that if a kid is born to a family that's in the top quintile, uh, something like 77% of those kids will get a college degree by the time they're 24. 
If a kid is born into the bottom quintile, it's single digits. I forget it was seven or nine. I'm interested in your, your point about ownership of land, of property, but I'm wondering what other ideas there are about the structure of reparations that would begin to go to the social aspect of economic inequality, particularly because we are such an urban country and so many people don't own property in cities. But that degree, that access to, to good jobs is a property, a piece of property. So I'm wondering what people are thinking. Well, there is all sorts of really innovative stuff. I think the Georgetown example is just incredible. I wish we could get Columbia to do the same thing, but we're not there yet. Um, but um, uh, other universities and colleges have, have also tried to own their past um, and make it part of their present, uh, and other institutions should as well. And that, I think, is a hugely important part of what reparations should look like. There is much of a demand for a formal apology, which we've seen in other contexts as well. Um, uh, President Obama, I think, went to some distance to issue an apology, but we haven't issued a national collective apology for slavery, as if it were something for which one could apologize, of course, um, but not having any sense of collective remorse, regret, reflection on that, having been uh, that slavery was um, such a horrendous part of our our national story um, is, is something. It's, not, it's uh, not sufficient, but it's certainly necessary in many people's minds. Um, uh, educational benefits, like we're seeing at, at Georgetown, many people also discuss, and I think you were gesturing in that direction as well. A, a lot of the research, though, in terms of how do you empower and enrich and transfer resources to communities um, that have been um, uh, underdeveloped, and that is so much what we've done in this country in the black community is underdevelop um, uh, the black community, uh, shows that an investment in individual education doesn't actually cash out in the long run in family, uh, increasing family or intergenerational economic um, uh, health as well as real property does. Um, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't still do it. <laughs> right? it, it. It remains a fact that we invest in education in black communities and other communities of color at far lower rates than we do in white communities. And we, and apart from slavery, we should do it anyway, of course. Um, there's uh, the movement for Black Lives has a very complicated, very thoughtful um, set of recommendations and a toolkit for thinking about reparations. Also includes, of course, ending mass incarceration, the death penalty, um, radical criminal justice reform, hugely important. Um, and so there are uh, many things that people are thinking about, all of which I think have to play a role in different communities in different ways. And what's appropriate in rural areas is different from what's appropriate in, in urban areas. I was just talking about the book in um, Baltimore with uh, young uh, uh, activists of color who are working on community land trusts in Baltimore, and that's, that's where I end up in the book, is with community land trusts investing that in them, in communities, um, in urban communities, with the money we're gonna take through the estate tax. Um, uh, and that's an interesting idea in a place like Baltimore or Detroit, um, where there is a lot of urban land. I live in Harlem. There's not a lot of land there. <laughs> not a lot of land here in Brooklyn um, uh, that we can allocate to community land trusts, although there are some really cool community land trust projects in New York. So, um, I, you know, and COBRA has, a, has a, a bunch of ideas as well. So I would I suggest you look at the Movement for Black Lives, new reparations um, suggestions on their website and in COBRA's as well. Is there any research on those who sold the slaves from Africa? Uh, thanks for that question, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> He said I shouldn't call on him, but I did. <laughs> uh, there's a great deal of research. Um, 
Yeah, there's a great deal of research. Um, actually, the field of, um, of African, what you might call African Atlantic history, the West and West Central African dimensions of the Atlantic slave trade is an incredibly rich historiographical field with um, an in incredible uh, range of scholarship, not just in the United States, but uh, people working on it in Brazil, in um, uh, different uh, European universities and West and West Central Africa itself. It's incredibly, incredibly rich and, and I think one of the most uh, innovative and flourishing fields in the study of slavery is the, is the study of the intersection of African political economies and the Atlantic slave trade. Um, at, in my, uh, my Atlantic World class, um, just this week, uh, my students are reading the autobiography of a man named Otaba Kuguano, who wrote one of the very few autobiographies written by uh, a man who experienced uh, um, the, the Middle Passage himself. And he's quite honest about uh, having been essentially kidnapped and sold by other Africans. But he says that the, in this autobiography, he said, there would, be no, uh, there would be no sellers if there are no buyers, which I think is an important insight that we should all keep in mind. Yeah. And one of the things I'd like to add to what Professor Rothman said, Mr. Rothman, <laughs> <laughs> is that <laughs> Outside of a few instances of illegal slave running from the United States to West Africa to bring Africans here, the slave trade between Africa and the Caribbean and the United States ended in 1808. And most of the people who were transported during the internal movement of people from the upper south to the lower south were, were people who had been born in America in slavery. So whoever sold the Africans in Africa didn't know that generation after generation after generation babies would be born into enslavement to live out all of their lives and be worked until they died. And that was in South America, in the Caribbean, and in the United States of America after 1776. For reparations, it's like uh, preaching, to the, preaching to the choir here. But uh, so if we stipulate that, that um, there is a case for reparations, and, and I understand you're historians in this historical society and you want to make that case, but uh, like $20,000 for every African American descendant here in the United States. Is that appropriate? Or you're talking about land as something. I, I, I like your idea about the estate tax to find them. But mm -hmm. I, I almost wanted to raise my hand at the beginning and say, OK, there is a case <laughs> for reparations, $20,000 for every uh, African no. descendant. You know, one thing I'm, I'm curious, and I'm, I, I, I and I'm, 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 a, I'm a journalist, so you know, I'm, I'm not a historian. Um, one thing that's interesting to me, though, is, um, and, and I'm curious about um, this question. Is probably is best answered by you, but is is the um, distaste for talking about cash, and I find that interesting. And I don't know if it's always been that way. Um, obviously, land was the first thing that, that, that people talked about. But there is kind of, um, I don't know, there, it feels uncomfortable, right? Yeah, well, King said, uh, you know, we're coming for our check. <clears throat> he wasn't uncomfortable with that. Um, I think uh, there are a bunch of ways in which we're un many people are uncomfortable with the idea of, of cutting checks to individual black people, like we did with the Japanese who were interned, right? right? which was a small group within the lifetime of their internment. 
um, uh, and, and so it wasn't all Japanese Americans, it wasn't all Asian Americans, it was the, the actual humans who had been interned. We, you know, obviously we can't do that now, it's been a lot, a lot longer. But one of the sources of discomfort is that writing checks now, and there are different ways to calculate how much those checks should be, should they be for the unpaid labor that was, that was undertaken by enslaved people collectively? Um, that to me seems like not enough. The, the, the evil of slavery is not that it was unpaid labor, although it was that too, but the, it, the being enslavable by virtue, as Melisande said, your skin color or your, your race is a much bigger concept. And, um, uh, and the, the violence and the, the horror of slavery is much larger than unpaid labor, stolen, stolen labor. And so where, how do you put a dollar on that larger sense of horror and, and violation? And is any amount of money enough? So the, the idea that one would put any number on that, I think, is uncomfortable for some people. On the other hand, you also hear the objection that to offer a dollar amount now is to ratify the exchange of people for cash, right? We're just doing it later. We're just paying you. Um, and so it feels like, you know, because the only thing we have is money really in order to express um, remorse or damages in so many ways, uh, it doesn't, you know, we look at the September 11th um, uh, compensation fund, similar set of discomforts there about commodifying the value of a life. How do we do that? And we, we got a guy to do it, <laughs> right? And he was happy to do it. A bunch of my students worked for him, um, figuring out what a value of a life was. And it is an ugly project. And so I think that's where some of that comes from. And then I was in a cab the other day, and this guy was taking me somewhere, and he said, what do you do? And I said, I write about reparations. And he said, well, don't give those people checks. It's just free money, and it'll reinforce that thing that they don't have to work for money. And so you get the right wing sort of more welfare for undeserving, you know, I don't know if you have to finish the story, kind of objection from people who feel like th these are undeserving people so many generations away. Um, and I'm sure Melisande has something I to say do. about that. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I would like to say that people were repaired for the loss of their property. Insurance, Lloyds of London, was created to compensate cargo that was human cargo that was lost at sea for the people who had invested in that cargo so they could be compensated for their losses. At the end of the Civil War, certain slave owners were compensated for the loss of their property, not the loss of their land, because they still have that. Their property was human beings. From 1804 to 2019, the second independent country in the New World we like to call it Haiti, has been paying reparations to France for freeing themselves from the rigors of dying on sugar, plane, sugar cane plantations to provide sweets for the French. So reparations means many, many things in many ways to different people. How can we as human beings living in the United States of America talk about repairing black people when right outside the door white supremacy is a serious problem? If we cannot change the culture of the country that says that people have the right under the guise of the freedom of speech to walk around in brown shirts and swastikas and torches, where in Germany 
if you put on a swastika and a brown shirt and march up and down the street, they're going to put you in jail. <laughs> so how is it that the freedoms of America don't cover all people. We've already done the studies in redlining, the banking, education, incarceration. This is not new people. This is, but everybody seems to be having a come to Jesus, Krishna, <laughs> Buddha, whoever you want to call on, everybody's now having a moment. But beyond your moment, what are you going to do in your life to make a change? Hi. I like to talk about getting back to the land, the property. I think that there needs to be a full analysis of the fact that homesteaders, uh, poor whites in this country, <laughs> had an opportunity to claim land in this country, and the government allowed them to do that. Yep. So I, th there needs to be some analysis between, we'll say, the 28. Uh, acres and a mule and reconstruction and the fact that the whites in this country had a hand up in getting free land. So there needs to be some kind of analysis between that and the land that we that was not given, to, well, we didn't have the opportunity to have. Yeah. I'd, I'd just like for the professor to speak on that. Thank Fortunately, you. there is an analysis. <laughs> <laughs> Right outside the gift <laughs> shop, and I'm happy to sign your book. <laughs> and I do talk about um, the Homestead Act there. And um, and I, there's one thing we have not, I mean, there's so many things we haven't talked about today. But one of them is also Native Americans. Land dis dispossession, right? genocide. And very often when we're talking about reparations for slavery, somebody raises their hand and says, you know, that is not the only original sin. And it is true. It is not the only original sin. There are many, and certainly one of the most fundamental is what happened with Native people here when Europeans land, landed. One of the things I talk about in the book is um, what, what freed people, black people wanted was land. And they were told that they weren't um, civilized enough to be able to handle it and make it profitable. They needed to be taught, kind of stewarded towards a kind of civilization and maturity in order to handle land, and that white people knew how to handle land. And that what, what black people needed was contract. They needed labor contracts with white people, and that living up to a contract would help civilize them, right? Native Americans wanted contract. They wanted treaties. And what they got was land. They got private property. They did not believe in private property. Land was something that was collectively used, not owned. We didn't have an idea. They didn't have an idea of ownership. But it, they were getting in the way of Western expansion, particularly if, if for white people moving out west, but also with the building of the railroads. They were, they were a problem, because they were roaming all over the place and getting in the way and attacking the, the white folks who were building the railroads and developing the west. So what the, what the federal government did, the exact same members of Congress who were saying to black people, you're not ready for land, what we're giving you is contract, said to the Native American people, you want contract? No, we're giving you land. We're going to make you settle in homesteads, build homes, and stop roaming around. Right? Get with the program, and part of civilizing them was getting them to understand private property. So these are very interesting stories that are all going on at the same time and are discussed in the book. <laughs> Rachel, could I, could I add one thing to this? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, just to go back to the history of the GU-272, which is, that's what I do. <laughs> um, there's an interesting story of land there. Um, so one group of the Jesuit slaves were sold to a planter named Jesse Beatty, who had a plantation named West Oak in Iberville Parish, Louisiana. Uh, he ends up selling that plantation, gets sold a few times. Um, but the community of enslaved people actually stays relatively intact on that site. 
Um, and you can actually track them through the sales and even into labor contracts overseen by the Freedmen's Bureau in the era of emancipation. Um, but some of those families who survived slavery and experienced emancipation actually banded together and were able to purchase part of the land of the plantation where they had been slaves. And some of those families actually own that land to this very day in a, in a town called Maringuin. Um, it's really a, a remarkable thing. And it's not all that uncommon. Uh, rates of land ownership and property ownership among uh, African Americans in the South actually increased substantially um, in, for two generations after emancipation. Uh, rates of African American land ownership by 1900 are, are I would not say great, but um, uh, they're, they're qu quite far from where they had been in, in 1870. The story of the 20th century is a story of tremendous loss of land, of theft and robbery and swindling and fraud, by which a lot of that, uh, a, lo a lot of African American families who held land um, had it slip away, had it torn away. You can't put that all on uh, at the feet of slavery. No. Um, there's been 150 years of plunder since that we also have to address. Yeah. And I think, too, we can say that the years during slavery, black people were somebody's property. We might beat you, and we might punish you. But we, we not gonna kill you because we need you back at work. And then after slavery, after the, 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 the abandonment of reconstruction and the institution of the Jim Crow years, so we get to 19, 19, 1920, and a really, really big thing happened in America. We will be celebrating, some of us will be celebrating this event next year, and it was the year white women got the vote. And white women and black women had been very, very much involved. Black people and white women were very involved in the suffragette movement, including Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, and there was this community of people who were pushing for the vote for women. Little problem happened, black men were voting. White women got a little bit upset because black men were voting and they did not have the right to vote, so they split with the black women. They were able to vote. They got the vote in 1920. Two big things happened. Prohibition got voted in, and over the next 30 years, some of the most stringent racist laws in America across the South and the Midwest and the North were enacted. And people lost rights. Tulsa, Oklahoma, big example. It's 1919. A hundred years ago, the Elaine, Arkansas massacre happened. Everybody knows about the Wounded Knee Massacre in America. How many of y'all know about Elaine? And why don't you know? Are there any um, lessons to be drawn from, uh, from the way, I'm sorry, from the way we treated our guilt about Native Americans? and uh, tried to resolve these issues by, with money. Um, and is there anything that, that, we, that we can learn from that experience and apply 
to resolving these issues and reconciling? Some of the Native American tribes and Indian tribes who were involved in the Confederacy and slave ownership, they're not reconciling their slave ownership. They were involved in the return slave capture, the Fugitive Slave Acts. There were six nations, Indian nations in the South who participated and fought for the Confederacy. Not all those black people that everybody believes was fighting for the Confederacy, but there were six Confederate Native American groups that owned and human trafficked and were part of the return of enslaved people to enslavement. So yes, we get around to talking about Native Americans when we talk about black people and reparations. But do Native Americans talk about black people when they have their gatherings? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure I would say that no Native Americans talk about black people, but I do think that the case of, um, of, of how we collectively wronged Native people is, is a different story and requires a different kind of repair than what we would say is appropriate for people who are um, uh, or reparations that would recognize the enslavement of black people in this country. So um, when, you, when you speak to people who in the Native American communities who are working on these issues today, you know, they're interested in sovereignty. They're interested in collective rights. And, and certainly restoration of, of, of ancestral lands, but their primary claim is for sovereignty. And so I think in so many respects when we have this conversation about reparations um, in the context of slavery, we don't, we don't always think about it as a collective remedy for a people. We think about it as individuals or the descendants of individuals. And I think the Native American case challenges us to, to think about how in the United States we really don't know how to do rights in a collective way. Rights are, are something that are delivered or are, are promised to individuals who make a claim against the state or an individual who has wronged them. And that's, a, that's I think, a weakness in the US legal system, is that the rights attach to individuals rather than for us to be able to conceptualize collective forms of identity, wrong, and entitlement. I think we should, we should if, 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 if either of you have a thought about why this hasn't happened. I mean, I think there, in fact, I actually brought with me, and this, the historian should speak, um, but, just to know, you know, in, in present time, what, what we're, people are up against in terms of this, it's, it's useful to think about what the polling shows about reparations um, and, and where the American public is. And um, this won't be a surprise, I don't think, but 67% of Americans are opposed to reparations. Um, and it breaks down, as you might expect, along racial lines. 81% of whites are opposed to reparation. 73% of blacks are, are for it, though. That means that there's a sizable percentage that have questions about it. Um, this is from a, a Gallup uh, poll. Um, interestingly, those numbers are changing. Um, in, in 2002, 14% of Americans uh, supported the idea of reparations. Um, in 2019, it was 29%. Um, so I think in, in, a, in, a pr in practical political you know, realities, I mean, I think that's one reason why that's not happening now. Um, one of the things that I thought was interesting about um, her book and her research was that it wasn't just Southerners who were opposed to this idea of, of, of land redistribution. Um, you know, the North benefited from this whole plantation economy, and even when slavery was ended, the, the need for cheap labor was quite a thing. And so even Northerners who were kind of appalled, and she can speak to this better than I can, right, helped to prevent this from taking place. Am I, I do have fair reading. Yes. 
I could leave it at that if we have to end, but yes. I mean, as this land in the Sea Islands was stolen from black folks, there were, they, the land wasn't always then returned to the former landowners, the former plantation owners. In many circumstances, it was northern investors who bought it on the cheap from the government and then, then set up the plantations to run as they had before um, with not technically enslaved labor, but legally, it's certainly not so, but it practically pretty much the same. And these are the Guggenheims, these are the, the Sanfords. I have an op-ed coming out, hopefully in the Times next week, about Mark Sanford's family owning one of these properties now and not giving any uh, recognition to the fact that um, that there were enslaved people who were who had this land stolen from them, but most uh, wealthy industrialists in the North bought land on the cheap and may in the South that had been confiscated from from Confederates. It was supposed to go to freed people, and um, uh, ended up in the hands of Northern investors. So it's it's on all of us. It's not just a, a Southern problem. <clears throat> You know, I don't know that um, there's any note to end the conversation on, um, but, but it, is, it is almost nine, if you can believe it. I think that's proof that this is a conversation that we never finish. Um, and um, I want to thank the panelists so much. <laughs>